Uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, uh, for joining us on this uh, webinar. I'm Himendra Mathur, co-founder at ThinkAg. Uh, this is the first webinar that we are doing on this topic, uh, making India a global powerhouse in the exports of food and agricultural products. Uh, and the reason I, we are doing it because we see that potential. Uh, and let me just take a couple of minutes to set the context. Uh, as we know, India is one of the largest producers of food in the world. And uh, we do have many competitive advantages, especially in certain categories like basmati, non-basmati rice, marine products, tea, coffee, spices. Uh, and what we saw in last couple of years is very, very motivating when it comes to exports of food out of India. For the first time, we touched uh, an export figure of $50 billion in FY 21-22, almost a 20% increase from the previous year, right? Uh, and uh, the target that the government has set is $100 billion for the food exports, which we all think is achievable. Um, but for that to happen, uh, we need a lot of policy uh, uh, sort of push. And, and we all know that the government is working on it. We are very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Sudhan Shu from APIDA on the call, and he can definitely talk about some of the initiatives that the government of India has taken. We also need a lot of investments in infrastructure, be it farm level infrastructure, ripening chambers, pick houses, uh, food testing laboratories, quality assaying laboratories, uh, uh, you know, infrastructure at the airports, cargo terminals. I think that is another very, very important area. And again, there are a lot of work happening. Government of India has launched this AIF fund, which has helped in improving the, the rural infrastructure, especially the farm level infrastructure. And there are multiple schemes. Uh, some from Ministry of Food Processing also to develop more of uh, processing uh, uh, infrastructure in the country. Then, of course, we also need, I think, some bit of innovation ecosystem coming into the play. And, you know, we, again, as we have seen in India, last five, seven years have been very, very good from a startup perspective, especially in agri-tech and food tech. Uh, we saw more than 1,500 startups, and that has led to uh, uh, you know, uh, building a lot of momentum in the villages, in helping farmers getting access to markets, in post data advisory financing, etc. But very interestingly, out of 1500 startups that we in India, very few have focused on exports so far, right? And uh, we are uh, again fortunate to have uh, Melexi as uh, one of those startups who's on the call today, and uh, Rohit, who's the co founder, will be moderating the session also. But we definitely need many more uh, startups who can work on the international food supply chain. We have few traceability startups, few quality assessing startups, few data centric startups who can potentially help us build that innovation ecosystem. But essentially, uh, you know, we, all we want to do together from this webinar series, bring in policymakers, bring in exporters, importers, uh, uh, shippers, financiers, insurance companies, certification agencies, and of course, startups and innovators to come together and, and build this dialogue so that we can uh, you know, discuss and debate the way forward and, and achieve the target that we have set for ourselves. So with those opening remarks, again, I welcome all the panelists and participants. Special thanks to Dr. Sudhanshu from APIDA, who was sparing valuable time uh, with us in, in, in giving his uh, inputs on this very important subject. And now I'll leave it to my friend uh, Rohit, from, who's a co-founder at Malexi, to introduce the panelists uh, as well as moderate the session. Over to you, Rohit. Rohit, unmute yourself. So, sorry, I was on mute. So, thanks a lot, uh, Evinder. I mean, this is, this is a wonderful opportunity, as you said, to get all the players in the ecosystem together and have a discussion on uh, on what can be done to make India a food and agriculture powerhouse. And uh, we are very fortunate uh, today to have a lot of uh, very, I would say, eminent uh, people on the platform uh, who, who can talk about this in great detail. I mean, first we have uh, Mr. Pradeep Shivasava. He is, uh, he is part of uh, uh, FASAR in Yes Bank, uh, has a deep amount of knowledge about uh, Food and agriculture as a domain has, has, has worked across government and private sectors uh, to understand the problem that faces uh, this sector and what can be done to actually improve it. 
Uh, Mr. Pradeep will also be presenting to us uh, after this and giving us an introduction to what uh, FASAR and Yes Bank typically sees as key challenges for us to, to work on to actually make India the powerhouse that it needs to be. Uh, we also have uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Abhishek Khan with us. Uh, Abhishek is, uh, is heading uh, the Agri Division uh, within RBL Bank. Again, comes with an enormous amount of expertise and understanding kind of what, what is happening at the grassroots level in the food and agriculture financing domain and, and what can be done actually to implement the incentives that the government has put in place, but also to actually encourage more and more financing to happen. So I think getting his thoughts on board would be uh, absolutely wonderful. We also have uh, Mr. Puneet Singh uh, Thind uh, on the call with us. He's, uh, he's the head and participant of a, a farmer producer organization in, in Punjab. Uh, he, he wants to sort of bring his perspective on, on how FPOs can power this uh, export um, sort of domination that we want to see India doing. And what is the collective role of uh, farm producer companies and organizations? What are the, some of the challenges that they, they also face? Um, then we have uh, Snehil. Uh, Snehal is uh, in Singapore. She is an importer, a buyer of Indian export uh, food and agriculture products. Uh, she is going to give us the perspective of uh, what are the you know what are the issues that importers face when they are uh, buying products from uh, from Indian exporters. Uh, what are some of the things that can be done from an importer perspective to to make this uh, volume of exports out of India grow? Um, then uh, we have uh, Mr. Kaushal. Uh, Kakar, who is uh, who is the CEO of uh, uh, one of the largest, uh, you know, vertically integrated food and agriculture export houses, KB Exports, and <clears throat> it'd be very useful to you know get his perspective. Almost twenty years spent, uh, you know, in this domain, uh, looking at all aspects of infrastructure, uh, you know, exporting tons of products in Europe and North America, and kind of you know it would be very interesting to get uh, uh, his perspective also on, on on this topic at hand and now and we have mr uh, sudanshu uh, who is uh, the secretary at uh, apeda and uh, again comes with uh, a, a more, enormous amount of experience on the policy side uh, will give us uh, what and a huge amount of information about what the government is trying to do uh, to speed up exports uh, to facilitate exports uh, and what are the areas, uh, both in terms of product categories as well as destinations that, that are being focused on, and what is being done at the supply level, what is being done at the state level uh, to make this uh, make this happen? And uh, last uh, but not the least, uh, we have uh, Ms. Chinmay. Uh, Chinmay is, um, is is looking at the quality side. Uh, has has spent a lot of time time in um, on this aspect of what can be done to improve uh, quality assaying. Um, putting technology in place to make uh, make this whole process of, of uh, understanding of quality of food and agriculture products more easier. Uh, she will also give us uh, some examples of uh, the non-tariff barriers that uh, that we are seeing. Um, so she uh, heads uh, um, a, a very very large uh, US-based uh, quality uh, company called Food Chain ID. And she's the head of uh, Southeast Asia. And it'll be very interesting to sort of hear her perspective, not just what's happening in India, but what is happening globally to improve uh, quality uh, of food and agriculture products and, and, and meet the requirements of the buyers across the world. So having said that, um, I will uh, sort of give the floor to uh, Mr. Pradeep. Uh, Pradeep is going to just take us through a presentation, setting the context of what we are doing and, and uh, what India needs to do actually going forward. Thanks, Rohit. Yeah, thanks, Abhijit. So uh, on behalf of uh, Yes Bank, I would like to uh, give a warm welcome and a hearty greetings to all the uh, panelists and stakeholders who have joined this virtual meeting. I am thankful to ThinkAg for providing us this opportunity to present the Indian Agri and Food Exports as a scenario. Uh, I have a total eight slides to set the context for panel discussion. So without wasting much time, uh, I will uh, 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 come to presentation. Uh, next slide. Next, please. Yeah. We all know that India is fortunate to have a strong endowments in agriculture. Uh, globally, India is the second largest agriculture producer and has the largest arable land. India is a leading producer of various agri products, including shrimps, spices, mangoes, papayas, bananas, milk, pulses, and other, others. 
uh, over the period of time, Indian agriculture is witnessing a change and the crops, while the biggest are gradually becoming a smaller segment of Indian agriculture sector and non-crop sectors like uh, uh, FNV, condiments, spices, livestock, fishing, aquaculture are growing rapidly. Uh, if you can see the right-hand side uh, graph, it can be noted that the decadal growth in production of some of these commodities like rice, oil seeds, meat, uh, and dairy products exceeds growth in consumption resulting in surplus stocks availability. The surplus availability of food in India warrants a close look at alternative offtake opportunities such as promoting domestic consumption of high value and healthy food, value addition through processing and uh, enhancing exports so as to maximize farm income and protect the livelihood of farmers. Next slide, Abhijit, please. This slide uh, depicts the uh, scenario of global agri-exports, current global agri-exports scenario. In 2021, global agri-exports value is recorded at 1.96 trillion US dollars, contributing about 9% to overall merchandise exports. Uh, the top 10 countries contribute to 48% of agri-exports value, which is visible uh, on the left-hand side of the graph while the top five countries, including USA, Netherlands, Brazil, and Germany contribute to about 30% of agri-exports value. Uh, point to be noted, India, despite uh, ranked second in uh, globally in terms of total agricultural production and occupying leading position in many high value agri-commodities contributes only 3% to global agri-exports -expo basket. Right hand side uh, graph where uh, category wise uh, uh, commodities are depicted. Globally, the top three key traded categories include cereals, meat, and animal or vegetable fats and oils. Uh, further going ahead, top 10 categories contribute to nearly 67% of the global food and agri exports in value terms. Analyzing the growth trend across categories, it can be noted that edible fruits and nuts and miscellaneous edible preparations witnessed highest growth of uh, about 5% each over the last decade. Next slide, Abhijit. Yeah, this slide uh, shows uh, current scenario of Indian agri-exports. India's agri agriculture export touched a new milestone by crossing 55 billion US dollar in the year 2021, registering growth of 33% over 2020. This would be the highest level ever achieved for agriculture exports and has been achieved in spite of unprecedented COVID challenges in the form of high freight rates, container shortages, et cetera. This promotion, uh, this achievement is the uh, uh, result of combined sustained efforts on the part of Department of Commerce and its various exports promotion agencies like APIDA, MPDA, various commodity boards, state governments, and proactive private sector. It can be noted that India's agri exports has registered a decadal growth of 2% and ranked 10th in terms of agri exports, contributing to about 3% of global agri exports. India's agri export is concentrated uh, in top 10 countries, which is visible from uh, right hand side graph, constituting nearly 56% in value terms. Uh, Bangladesh, USA, China, UAE, Vietnam being the leading destinations. And uh, together, uh, they contribute more than 40% uh, in agri-exports. As per the reports, continuing with the trend from the previous year, the agri-exports rose, uh, 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 increased by 14% in the first three months of the current financial year, that is 2022-23, from April to June, compared to the corresponding period of financial year 21-22. Uh, next slide, Abhijit. This, uh, this slide depicts the uh, agri-export basket of India. The slide is uh, very much self-explanatory how India uh, uh, came forward from uh, $42 billion to $56 billion in 2021. So India has diversified agri-export ba basket comprising of cereals, cotton, uh, seafood, meat, sugar, FNV, spices, oil seeds, tea, coffee, beverages, cocoa, and others. Out of these, if we talk about uh, uh, top six key categories, that is cereals, cotton, seafood, meat, sugar, FNB, these six com uh, categories contributes almost 75% of India's agri-export basket. 
In each of these category, India has retained its position as a key supplier to, uh, to the world for a select few products, for instance, basmati rice in cereals, groundnuts in uh, oil seeds, buffalo meat, frozen shim, uh, shrimp in fisheries, mango, pomegranate, and grapes and fruits. In 2021, the highest ever exports have been achieved for staples like rice, 9.6 billion US dollar, wheat, uh, more than 2 billion US dollars, other cereals, more than $1 billion, cotton, uh, uh, almost $10 billion, US dollars, sugar, more than $4 billion. Exports of marine products also reached the highest ever at $6.7 billion, US dollars, benefiting farmers in the coastal states of India. Spices exports have touched uh, $3 billion US dollar for the second year in a row. Uh, next slide, Abhijit. Uh, this is the key slide. Where lies the potential? and uh, what uh, 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 where we need or india needs to focus in uh, significant uh, white space exists in critical global agri exports value chain where india has the potential to increase its share the top 5 signif significant agri value chains uh, which includes fnb bovine uh, shrimp rice and spices are uh, must win for india which are anticipated to add incremental more than 30 billion US dollars over uh, next five to eight years. And uh, India is expected to succeed in these key agri value chains by increasing global competitiveness, embedding sustainability, ensuring quality needs of the destination markets, and therefore creating a distinct position. There is immense opportunity for India to expand its agri exports to Europe, USA, Middle East, Southeast Asian countries. And to achieve this, a focused strategy is critical to make India a powerhouse of agri-exports. Interventions for improving cost competitiveness and quality are needed, needed at several points along the crops value chain, right from inputs, logistics, infrastructure, to processing, and other forms of value addition to the products. In addition, policy and regulatory reforms will also be required. Any weak link in the chain could lead to entire value chain effort failing. Next slide, Abhijit. So uh, challenges across uh, agri-exports uh, uh, supply chain uh, to be responsive to global market demand in terms of cost, quality, and hygiene, and be a reliable supplier, India needs to take focused action to overcome deep-rooted challenges that exist at each leg of its agri-value chain. The key challenges that impact the agri-value uh, chain includes farm level uh, issues like uh, low farm productivity, farmers limited access to factors of production, low economies of scale leading to cost inefficiencies, uh, resulting in untapped small farmers potential to deliver exportable surplus, uh, post-harvest infrastructure uh, lacunas in terms of insufficient aggreg uh, aggregation, marketing, storage and processing infrastructure, fragmented logistics, multiple intermediation or handling, high cost of logistics and storage, quality assurance deficiencies in terms of agri exports safety, quality management, sustainability, and traceability not sufficiently oriented to meet international quality requirements. Low level of processing and value addition, very important, due to inconsistent raw material quality, fluctuating prices, irregular supply, raw product diversification, comparatively high cost of doing business, leading to low level of processing in the country. Branding and marketing uh, uh, deficiencies are there due to lack of holistic demand-led branding, lack of coordinated effort uh, to branding and export promotion, fragmented and multiple departmental government efforts, lack of access to finance, limited access to adequate and timely finance impa impacts exports, specifically the SMEs. Conflicting policies and regulations such as MSP and buffer stock norms, exporters' access to incentives, heavy documentation procedures at ports hinders exports' competitiveness. Also, trade barriers like diverse SPSS norms, MRL standards, poor transparency, free trade agreements, preferential duties, non-tariff barriers affect Indian exports adversely. Next slide, please. So to boost agri exports from the country, government of India is making uh, very significant effort, efforts. The uh, Department of Commerce Government of India 
has uh, uh, already formulated India's first agriculture export policy to create a paradigm shift from residual export after meeting domestic demand to targeted export according to the preferences of, of uh, overseas market. The policy clearly identifies potential export crops and recommends a cluster focused approach. It uh, also outlines measures for infrastructure development, brand India marketing, R&D and others. Besides agricultural exports policy, Government of India has also initiated various programs and schemes, uh, which is shown uh, uh, in the right hand side, uh, to strengthen agri exports value chain, including farm level support, post harvest value chain, uh, value addition infrastructure development, establishment of market linkages, branding and promotion support. Next slide. So uh, concentrated efforts are required to overcome the major challenges hampering the growth and competitiveness of Indian agri-exports. This in turn warrants synergies between the government, the private sector, the farmers, financial institutions, as well as interdepartmental collaboration uh, to work towards key facets, including orienting a smallholder farming community towards exports, promoting investments in building export-oriented end-to-end infrastructure, including processing and validation, developing capacities to meet international quality standards and requirements, nurturing an export enabling policy and regulatory environment, navigating trade barriers and enable market access, rolling out international demand-led marketing and branding exercise and promote make in India and leveraging public-private partnership across export-oriented agri value chains. Next slide, Abhijit. Yeah, that's it. So uh, uh, on behalf of Yes Bank, I once again uh, thank ThinkEck for giving us this opportunity for our presentation, wishing everyone present here a great success of this event. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Pradeep. Really informative, uh, really interesting actually to see how quickly India has grown over the past uh, year or so and what are the sort of the key challenges, as you mentioned, uh, which is uh, quite interesting as well. I mean, India is, is different in a way because, I mean, a lot of the land holding that exists in India are small, uh, you know, land holding, smallholder farming, and trying to get them to export is a little bit of a different channel, a challenge than that would be in, in Western countries like uh, like the US, where, um, uh, you know, large uh, farm uh, holding is, uh, is prevalent. So I think uh, what I'll do is uh, probably I'll start with uh, Dr. Sudhanshu. I mean, Sudhanshu, sir, is, uh, is a bit... Uh, uh, limited on uh, on time as well. I mean, he's, he's only available uh, to talk to us till five o'clock. So maybe I'll address the first couple of questions to uh, to Sudanshu sir and uh, get his views on on what is happening on the government side. What is the PEDA doing? Um, and Sudanshu sir, I mean, <clears throat> one of the things first things that I'd like to ask you is uh, currently what are the initiatives undertaken that by a PEDA? You know, I mean, given that one of the things that the PM wants to do as a part of Atmanirbhar Bharat uh, is to ensure that local products that India has got a capacity in is uh, something that finds favor in, in the export market. So, uh, I mean, it would be interesting to sort of hear from you what initiatives uh, are being undertaken uh, to make sure that vocal for local is there and local goes global. Uh, thanks, uh, Rohit. Uh, first, uh... Uh, let me thank uh, Think AG for uh, inviting me. And uh, uh, this is the real time to have uh, uh, such kind of webinar and uh, have brainstorming when we are in a process of uh, uh, getting an agriculture export powerhouse. So we all know that India is an agrarian economy. And uh, so uh, we can achieve a lot, but at least we have come on the path. Uh, where uh, we have been able to uh, prove that when the disruption in supplies were there, but the agri export was the area we were able to uh, sustain and uh, prove the world uh, that uh, we are a reliable supplier in the uh, uh, such a tough situations. So, uh, as far as the question related to this Atmir Bhar Bharat or the uh, Honorable Prime Minister's vision for uh, Local uh, uh, goes global. APIDA has taken a number of initiatives. Uh, for example, uh, for promotion of uh, GIE products, indigenous products, noble products, such as new products. 
and new products to the extent where the products were not known in the global trade. And we pushed such kind of uh, products. And uh, we basically tried to uh, connect with the production areas and uh, where we organized the capacity building uh, programs uh, for uh, sensitizing the farmers for export oriented production. We also interacted with the, the state horticulture department because they are responsible for uh, guiding the farmers uh, what to grow, how to grow, and uh, so that the export-oriented production is there as per the requirement of reporting that. Uh, despite that, challenges are there in terms of pest and disease and pesticide residue. Uh, we all know that uh, technically uh, both are complementary to each other. If a pest and disease will emerge, uh, obviously a farmer is bound to uh, apply uh, pesticide. And if the pesticide application is not proper, uh, it is uh, used in high doses and the PHI is not maintained. Obviously, the pesticide residue is there. And until the farmer is properly guided, educated, how it is to be handled, the poor farmer will suffer because ultimately, if the produce is to be sourced for exports, so, so either the exporter will not take the produce or if the exporter takes the produce uh, without the lab testing and it goes to the importing country, then the rapid alert will come or the rejection will happen. And ultimately, it comes on uh, the farmer. A farmer and the exporter both have to intervene. So uh, let me uh, cite a couple of the products uh, which uh, basically we tried to uh, this uh, niche products uh, which were not known or in the category of GI or the, the uh, new products. Uh, we have uh, pushed the export of a uh, few products, for example, uh, because millet, uh, we know millet is a potential product, especially in the light of that international year of millet to be organized uh, next year. So uh, from Uttarakhand, uh, we uh, pushed uh, this uh, millets, uh, which was the organic millet, and it was uh, so much publicized uh, that the, uh, the exporters got very good orders for uh, millets from Uttarakhand. Then uh, from uh, apples from Himachal Pradesh, uh, we uh, got organized the shipments from uh, Himachal Pradesh. Uh, this uh, fresh jackfruit from Tripura, Burmese grape, Burmese grapes from Assam. Uh, then uh, red rice uh, from Assam, uh, this uh, tender jackfruit from Assam to uh, multiple destinations. Uh, number of uh, fresh vegetable shipments uh, with the, the, the new vegetables which were not being exported from a uh, couple of the production areas who were exported. And I would like to uh, make a mention here, uh, we even tried for those products where uh, India production is not sufficient. For example, dragon fruit. Dragon fruit is not an Indian product. But we came to know that, that there is a potential of uh, uh, dragon fruit. So uh, we uh, checked up in which all state the dragon fruit produced and uh, this uh, we organized the trial shipment of uh, uh, dragon fruit to a different market our one of our leading exporter of uh, fresh fruits and vegetables uh, kb exports is always there uh, some of the uh, products uh, were shipped by them and uh, i am not able to exactly recall which was the product uh, the product partial uh, may correct me later i think one of the product was uh, uh, GI, which was a GIE product, which was Kapota from Anu. Uh, Kaushal, you may correct me while your uh, address. And uh, similarly, uh, such type of products we pushed. Uh, and the idea was to uh, basically create a brand image of the country and uh, uh, basically making a, a local product uh, by, by way of publicizing it and connecting to the global market. So these are the initiatives for basically the products like under the category of GI or new or the noble or anything product. No, thanks, Dr. Sanchu. I think that's uh, that's wonderful. I think India has a huge potential. I mean, given the variety of climates that we have, the variety of growing conditions that we have, we have the ability, obviously, to export a lot of uh, very boutique products as well. And I, I keep hearing all, all the times that there is like kiwi production in Arunachal Pradesh, uh, which, you know, I mean, I, I never knew. We still import a lot of kiwis from outside, from South Africa, from New Zealand. And and be interesting to actually see whether we can uh, do a more sort of uh, uh, active job of promoting these local indigenous products that we have. 
Um, I think one of the questions that uh, also, I mean, we all have is uh, as a part of the agri-export policy implementation, uh, I mean, what, what is specifically being uh, done to sort of help the states focus on exports? Because uh, obviously every state has its own um, sort of framework on which they want to export. So what is a PEDA doing to coordinate all of the exports from the individual states? Uh, agri -expo uh, agriculture export policy was announced in December 2018, and uh, this was the first policy uh, which was uh, launched by government of India. And uh, let me uh, explain the need, why there was a need of policy. Uh, a foreign trade policy was uh, there in place, which covers all the products. But uh, why there was a need for the agri specifically agriculture export policy, the reason being with the experience of uh, uh, past number of years, it was found that export is not being given the focus or priority by the state government. It is treated to be as the priority of the central government, but central government cannot take it because the reason the, pro the this production is a state subsidy. So whatever supply chain interventions are required in the in the production process or the pre harvest or the post harvest. The support from the state government is required. So, with this uh, objective, the agriculture export policy was announced, and uh, an institutional mechanism was set up uh, from starting from district level to state level, that is from state level to central government level, and the clear cut role and responsibilities uh, were defined. And what APIDA has, and APIDA has been made the nodal agency for implementation of agriculture export policy for the products. Uh, mandated to APIDA uh, for uh, 700 plus products are looked after by APIDA in the entire agriculture export basket. So what we did, uh, we thought uh, how, how, how to start. So uh, we started with uh, pursuing with the state government for designation of a state nodal agency and a state nodal officer. So that one agency should be responsible in a state. So uh, wherever the, the entrepreneurs, the exporters, the processors, the stakeholders face problems, there should be a single window who can coordinate with the concern department. So uh, with the pursuance of uh, APIDA uh, uh, till now, uh, the, uh, all, all the 28 states and uh, four UPs have uh, designated the state nodal agency and the nodal officer. Uh, the state level, UP level export monitoring committee is also a part of uh, this agriculture export policy, uh, which has been set up in 26 states and these monitoring committees are chaired by uh, respective chief secretary of the state and having the members of all concerned department, the, the state horticulture department, agriculture department, food processing, animal husbandry, plant quarantine, who all are the part of the supply chain of uh, the exports. Uh, a focus has been given on the cluster level approach. The cluster level approach because uh, for uh, uh, the potential product, there are production clusters. For example, if we say for potato, uh, the for uh, the table potato, the production clusters are there in uh, UP, Punjab. Uh, though Punjab is mainly for tea potato, West Bengal is there, uh, Bihar is there. So, uh, gherkins in Bangalore, there is a cutting for gherkins. The hydrated onion in uh, Bhavanagar in Gujarat. So, a number of uh, the clusters, though under the export policy, only 29 clusters have been notified uh, for, for a PIDA product. So uh, we thought, uh, let a state agri-export plan be prepared by each state government, which should have a blueprint of the potential products of a state which can be pushed for export. A, B, what kind of infrastructure is required, infrastructure in terms of pack houses, processing units, laboratories, reefer vans, whatever is required uh, to be used by, by the exporters. So um, till now, 22 states uh, and two UPs have finalized their state specific action plan. And the other states are in the process of uh, finalization. Now, uh, with the uh, preparation of these state specific action plans, at least now the state government has come to know what needs to be done. If these are the potential products in their states, which has uh, uh, export prospects. The inter intervention in terms of uh, the infrastructure, the what quality initiative need, needs to be taken, and uh, with regard to even the uh, marketing aspect also, 
they are uh, sensitized to the state specific action plan how they have to market their product in terms of proper packaging in terms of labeling in terms of branding to be done and uh, so a blueprint is uh, there uh, the state some of the state governments have started implemented uh, implementing their state specific action plan uh, though uh, it's a long way to go um, but the results have started coming which we are able to see uh, in the case of UP, I would like to uh, cite an example with the uh, preparation of the state specific action plan. Uh, we uh, got Varanasi uh, as the, the potential area for fresh vegetables, though it was the cluster was not notified. And I would like to inform all the, the participants and the panelists that it has been a citing story for us that uh, in uh, Varanasi, where it's a landlocked area, earlier not a single exporter from Varanasi or the adjoining areas were there. Not only that area in UP, very less number of exporters for agri products are there, especially for fresh fruits and vegetables. So uh, in Varanasi, we started the journey. We basically connected uh, the exporters to uh, the FPOs, farmer producer organizations. The first the farmer producer organization, which were defunct or some of the farmer production organizations were created. We connected with them as total. Since last two years, regular shipment of vegetables are being sent uh, from Varanasi. So th this, is, this is basically the impact. And uh, in uh, some of the other areas also, for, for example, in the uh, case of uh, this uh, Pheni, though that cluster is already known for banana, banana export already there. But the, the, from the new FPOs, the exporters were connected and the produce was taken and they exported. So this is the process, this is the approach which we have adopted. And uh, we are confident that uh, with the proper implementation of agri-export policy, definitely we will be able to achieve the ultimate objective of the policy which, with which uh, it was announced. Great, great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sudanshu. I mean, I'd like to go a level uh, deeper. I mean, we talked about sort of national level policy. We talked about what we what is Papeda is doing at the state level. I want to kind of concentrate now also on the district level, and and understand. I mean, there are all, all these uh, uh, ODOP and DEH uh, schemes which which are trying to sort of focus at at a, what what can we do at a district level, and just want to understand what initiatives are being taken to 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 you know supplement the one district one product and district export hubs um, by FEDA. Uh, this uh, one district, one product is basically uh, an approach which is adopted, uh, started by Ministry of Commerce, and uh, it was requested to Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Food Processing, to basically identify one district, one product. And uh, what APIDA did, we basically uh, took those products uh, of which the clusters have, were identified. The clusters were uh, uh, this notified, and so with the Ministry of Agriculture and Ministry of Food Processing, the common clusters have been made, so that there is a synergy between, or there is a convergence between the schemes of all these uh, the concerned organizations. For example, MIDH, Ministry of Food Processing, there's this, this uh, PMFME scheme, so that in a particular cluster, whether it is a cluster for PIDA, the same cluster is from MIDH, the same cluster for Ministry of Food Processing. There is a convergence of the scheme so that the entrepreneurs and the exporters are able to uh, get the benefit. And as for the DEH is concerned, this district export hub is looked after by DGFP. So APIDA is uh, closely working with the DEH and the districts uh, where basically the potential products are there. Uh, we have already identified few, few products. And from those, some of the districts, the, even we organized the export promotion programs also. For example, in case of this, uh, uh, mangoes. Uh, uh, last year, we organized the mango promotion program in Japan with the help of Indian Mission in Japan. And uh, that was under the uh, initiative of DHO. From few identified districts, uh, we basically organized the shipment of mangoes, and those uh, mangoes were uh, used for uh, promotional purposes. Uh, the uh, Indian Embassy identified a couple of restaurants. Indian Embassy couple identified a couple of retail chains where the mangoes were sent. And uh, later the, the, the Indian exporters, uh, they supplied their mangoes to uh, the exporters in Japan. And uh, the export to Japan has been uh, there since last more than 10 years. But uh, in the current year, 
uh, we were able to uh, increase the quantum of exports, not significantly, but much better than earlier. Great, great. Now that's that's good to hear. I think these are the kind of activities from market access perspective that uh, we need to do more of uh, for Indian uh, products. Um, now, just going, I, mean, I know you are, you only have uh, 10, 15 minutes with us, so just want to make sure we maximize the time that we have with you. Um, now, going down one more level, you know, I mean, the Indian government has announced that they want to create another 10,000 uh, pound producer organizations um, the co and pound producer cooperatives. Uh, what, exa what exactly is, uh, is a PEDA again thinking about in terms of ensuring that these FPOs and FPCs are able to fulfill their mandate? I mean, one of their mandates is to ensure that on the output side, they are able to connect on the export linkage side. Uh, but uh, from all that we know, and uh, we'll hear from Puneet as well, kind of what, what he sees uh, as, a, as a shareholder in an FPO. But what do you think uh, is, is needs to be done and what is being done by PEDA to, to make these export linkages uh, with the FPOs and FPCs? Very good question. And uh, the focus of the government is today uh, to create uh, 10,000 FPOs, strengthening of FPOs. And uh, basically, the FPOs are being promoted in agriculture produced clusters for leveraging the economies of the scale and uh, improving the market access for uh, increasing agri-exports. So uh, what APIDA has done, the government has mandated the responsibility to a couple of organizations like SFAC, uh, NABARD, uh, for uh, creation of uh, the uh, FTOs. What APIDA did, we have collaborated with these organizations, we have signed MOU with NABARD, we have signed MOU with uh, uh, SFAC, uh, NCDC uh, for cooperatives, because uh, we are not only concerned with FPOs, we want basically farmer growth. The reason being because the, the quality or the export-oriented produce, because we have been getting the feedback from the exporters that the quality produce is not available, and which cannot be available through the, because we have the fragmented land holding. And the, the different kind of package of practices are being followed by the farmer. You can't collate a uh, produce in, uh, uh, with the uniform quality. The, in terms of physical characteristics and other things also. And uh, so uh, we uh, signed MOU with these, or we signed MOU with even NAFED also, TRIFED also, where we are able to have a group of farmers. So uh, with these organizations, we identified first A, uh, who all are the FPOs related to FPOs or farmer producer company or the self help group for PIDA products. Then we organize capacity building programs for these FPO and FSC. And then try to identify in these production areas if there is a need for any infrastructure, be sensitized through a financial assistance scheme. And ask our exporters to venture into that area. Uh, either they should set up an infrastructure there, they can avail financial assistance from APIDA or the other agency, or we educated the FPOs to become exporters so that FPO can also uh, avail assistance. And but at the first level, after the capacity building, we uh, connected FPOs to the concerned exporter so that exporters are able to store quality produce. A, exporters are able to guide them what kind of produce is required, what is the requirement of a particular importing country, how they have to grow in terms of physical characteristics and uh, with the, the other quality parameters. We also organized uh, buyer seller meets uh, of FPOs with the exporters in various areas. Uh, even in the Northeast states, in all these states, we have organized buyer-seller meet of FPOs with uh, uh, the exporters. The exporters were not there in the Northeast region, but we have taken exporters from other states and uh, organized the buyer-seller meet. And with this, if you see in the last three years, two to three years, the, the some amount of export from Northeast has started. So logistic challenges are there. The, the required quantum, quantum, it will take time. But you might be seeing, seeing through the social media uh, from uh, either from uh, Assam, Tripura, Manipur, Mizoram, Nagaland. And we keep on uh, publicizing uh, through uh, we, uh, A, uh, by sending the trial shipment, then connecting to the, any retail chain, and then publicizing. So that the, the product of a particular state, or the backward state, or the, the state which has a logistic constraint. For example, JNK and Ladakh. For JNK, we got this apple, cherry, 
from Jammu Kashmir, the trial shipment, apricot from Ladakh. So we uh, we try to touch those states where the logistic challenges are there. Uh, and the idea was just to lay down a road that it is possible and so that the trade can take it further forward. Great, great. No, I mean, uh, uh, this, this is fascinating. I mean, obviously, I didn't know that there were apricots in Ladakh. Uh, so this is this is something that I think most of us in India also need to know before we actually start to expose it to the foreign markets. So that's that's very interesting. On this level of uh, FPOs and FPCs, I mean, we've got uh, Puneet uh, as well with us, who is uh, somebody who has experience working uh, collaboratively in FPOs and FPCs. Um, I would sort of pose a question to uh, to Puneet as well. Uh, Puneet, what do you think are uh, some of the challenges that FPOs and FPCs see when they are actually looking at exports, and what what can be done to address them, in your view? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, I really thank everyone, and uh, thanks for having me here. And especially, we have just listened about FPO. Uh, see. At ground, uh, things are, you know, very difficult because we have given 30, 40 years to the cooperative sector and comparatively a farmer producer company, basically, which is a comparatively a new model, a hybrid between a private com company and a cooperative. So what we have seen uh, in last five to six years that FPOs uh, who are newly formed, they are facing, you know, challenge in uh, working in a new environment, understanding the compliances, and uh, without any hesitation, I admit that uh, still we are too far from, from a stage where we can confidently, you know, uh, compete with the global market. Now, coming to the challenges, I think uh, in India, in general, we have seen that we have a habit of, you know, asking for the individual components, uh, like subsidy on machine, subsidy on uh, transport, subsidy on fertilizer, on input. But actually, we lack a, a complete value chain approach where we focus on the end result. And this is a mistake I think again and again we are making and even government of India when they have announced this policy of 10,000 FPO, I don't know why they have not you know, considered what, what has happened to the FPO which were pre previously promoted since 2014 when they have announced the first policy. Uh, initially, we have targeted for 1,000 FPO. Uh, that every FPO, it has to be, you know, a member of uh, a 50 fee, a farmer interest group, making a total of 1,000 farmer. Um, but those FPO, they were not, you know, functional. And then government of India came up with a, a new figure of 300 farmers. Uh, again, I don't know where this figure comes from. So actually, the farmers, uh, uh, they, they need a ecosystem where they can operate and they, they need operational flexibility. Uh, so why FPOs are not performing is a one subject. I, I think I can go into detail in explaining why FPOs itself are not performing. And uh, if FPOs are not, are not uh, you know, serving the purpose they are designed for, and I'm talking in general, of, of course, there are a few exceptions. And, uh, uh, you know, export is something that first deserve then desire. If we are, uh, you know, we have a system in place where we can handle the produce well, we, where we have a full traceability of the uh, produce, where we can, uh, you know, we have a supply chain infrastructure at local level uh, to deal with the uh, deal with the exporter. Uh, in general, most of our commodities they are, you know, uh, they are handled by the traders. Uh, we just focus on, focus on what about me. Uh, we don't have, you know. Uh, uh, a long-term view and export is something which is eventual stage we can't deal the uh, you know in the export we can't deal in the same culture as we deal in the domestic that kisi ko bhi percent commission pe diya or you know he pick, picks up the produce uh, i think one more subject where fpos are facing a challenge is the quality assurance uh, we are in touch with the quality assurance program for, for, from Australia, Fresh Care Australia. Uh, and uh, most of you, uh, most of the participants, they might be aware that nothing is sold in the organized sector in Australia if it is not certified by uh, the certification body. But here in India, we, we, let, uh, we can't easily find a good quality assurance body, which is, uh, you know, 
trusted by the buyer as well and farmers they have a trust on the uh, they can bear the expense of the those uh, quality assurance program end of the day you know we, we even within india we don't have a, i'm sorry to use this word but we don't have a mature market so if we are buying today tomato at 2 rupee kilo and suddenly if there is a uh, you know uh, increase in the prices uh, we you know we see kind of protest we see i mean gale mein wo mala dal ke you know so i don't know why we uh, we are not able to you know create a, a market for the safe produce in in the country and export as i say we never export all the commodity we have to to uh, handle export quantity and then there is a second and third grade which we have to you know ensure the offtake in the domestic market uh, i think lot of homework in short i think uh, uh, i can explain more gray areas but lot of homework is yet to do then we can target for the export market well thank you puneet i think that's very interesting to sort of hear and understand as well and i think i'd like to pick up sort of one specific point that you mentioned which is around quality you know and ensuring that uh, we have a minimum sort of standard of quality if not for domestic but at least for uh, for exports as well and uh, maybe uh, what i'd like to do is i'd like to pose that question to chinmay so chinmay is here i mean she had uh, food chain id i quickly wanted to sort of get a view on uh, on on the issue of quality per se and how big of it of an issue is it uh, rohit if you allow sorry for the interruption and sure. because I, i have to leave yes, for please, another, please. another english but i was just uh, listening what uh, the pudin singh was uh, mentioning about the practical difficulties and uh, some of the points i have noted for and uh, as far as the uh, difficulties being faced i agree he, he is mentioning that the fpos who have already availed assistance in the past and uh, a, a review needs to be taken definitely i will pass it on to ministry of agriculture who has the basically who have formulated the scheme for uh, providing all assistance and uh, but the the concern expressed by him is very well noted because the entrepreneur unless the practical difficulties and the execution or implementation of fpo is not properly done the purpose will not be achieved so uh, puneet i have taken a note of it and uh, whenever in the meetings with the ministry of agriculture or ministry of rural development i will definitely highlight this thank okay. you sir so yeah dr sudhanshu i'll sort of uh, since you only have a couple of minutes with us maybe i'll what i'll do is i'll take this opportunity to also sort of go around the table uh, ask uh, both snehal who's an importer in singapore as well as as kaushal uh, to sort of just maybe um, articulate very quickly what are the key issues they see uh, which they would like to see a peda address so snehal i'll i'll, uh, I'll let you go first uh, since you are in, you are importing today Uh, what are the issues you see uh, from an export perspective out of india that you like to see addressed thoda samar ghan ketha tari chalele ha yeah hi everyone uh, there is uh, some issues like post harvesting technology is very weak in india uh, so many indian exporters exporting the cargo with an unhygienic unhygienic conditions and uh, due to this they lost the uh, percentage of market share and getting low price and uh, un ethically efforts of uh, profit margin they are getting low margins uh, if you compare with uh, new zealand australia they are having uh, very huge margins but india we can't uh, we we don't have any uh, harvesting technology like uh, new zealand australia us uk so we have to uh, take precaution in that great are there any other challenges you you see or um, this is primarily the quality issue that was mentioned uh, before as well which uh, we need to take better care of pardon uh, are there any other uh, specific issues that you see from an export perspective or quality and uh, hygiene and sanitation those aspects are are the most important ones yeah this these are the most uh, important and uh, apart from this uh, there are uh, freight rates then uh, logistic issues we are not getting inventory uh, then uh, exporters are not getting finance as well these are minor issues finance is a major issue actually got it so access to credit is also an important aspect uh, to get continuous supply from exporters is what you're saying yeah 
great. Skoshal, I'll, I'll, I'll let you also uh, sort of put your opinions on the table. What, what, what can be done to uh, make things better and what can the government do uh, to help? Uh, thank you, Rohit. So, yeah, I think uh, the, the theme of the presentation, uh, you know, started with Pradeep Ji was about uh, how the production is more stronger in Indian context and the consumption or the uh, export facilitation is not, not as strong. So I think that is something which really needs to be addressed uh, and APIDA can definitely play a big role in that. APIDA is a facilitating agency and it facilitates our interactions with quarantine department with some uh, embassies outside of India. And uh, as Dr. Suzanne Shoh very rightly pointed out, I think the Indian embassies are the most underutilized aspect of uh, trade promotion from our point of view. Uh, when the Japanese embassy, the Indian embassy in Japan, uh, they uh, kick-started the mango promotion program. It was uh, extremely uh, high impact. So we not only managed to secure business, we almost felt like we had a representative office of ours in that country. So I think if that model can be replicated uh, and if APIDA can try and uh, you know play a more facilitating role with that kind of a, uh, a facilitation, then I think it can really enhance India's exports. Uh, apart from that, uh, I think the quarantine aspects are also something that need to be looked into. Uh, there are a lot of market access which the quarantine department fights for, but an industry interface can probably help in uh, getting the access utilized in the best possible way. I think these are two areas, one on the uh, Indian embassy utilization for marketing of Indian products. And the second is uh, some more market access initiatives from the quarantine that APIDA can have a role to play in both of those. Great. So tighter industry APEDA cooperation to address market access as well as the regulatory issues. That's right. Great. Dr. Sudanshu, any, any, any sort of opinions on, on these aspects, on quality, on financing, on logistics, on uh, tighter integration uh, between uh, industry as well as, uh, as uh, facilitating agencies like APEDA? What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, thanks. I will definitely like to uh, respond on uh, these points. Uh, first, let me take uh, what Snehal has mentioned about uh, the quality aspect, the freight rate, logistics and credit. Uh, with respect to quality of uh, produce uh, is concerned, it depends on, though it's a free market, the importer can select any exporter. But while the selection of the exporter, the importer can very well tell that what they exactly want. Let me tell you that as far as this infrastructure is required in horticulture sector, APIDA introduced uh, back houses, I think 20 years back, and sensitized the trade about uh, what is the importance of back house. And uh, for the panelists and other participants also, I would just like to clarify or uh, for, for the enrichment of the knowledge of the, the participants. Backhouse is basically an infrastructure where the fresh produce is being uh, brought and it is collated and it is processed and packed in an hygienic environment. So the, the question of uh, the unhygienic can be addressed here. So now the, the exporters who are quality cautious, for example, let us talk about Kaushal. I, I think Kaushal KB export is having their packhouses more than 15, 20 when the packhouse concept started. Uh, they started setting up the back house and uh, by setting up a back house in investment. But because it depends on the, the, the exporter, if you have to play long term, which markets you want to export, you will have to make investment also. It is not only the question of I am uh, mentioning about uh, the large exporters who can afford in setting up a back houses. APIDA address for a small and medium exporters also, we set up common infrastructure facilities, common back houses in Maharashtra, Gujarat, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh. Everywhere, I, I, I am not saying that these common infrastructure facilities are being utilized. But in the state of Maharashtra, the common pack houses are utilized by the exporters, small and medium exporters, who, who cannot invest uh, in the setting of the facility. So this was uh, with uh, respect to uh, quality. And uh, with regard to freight rate, I would like to make a mention that it is not in the control of the government because uh, the uh, Ministry, we have taken up with Ministry of Civil Aviation, Ministry of uh, Surface Transport, uh, Shipping Industry also, because it is to be decided by the industry. 
So, so, so government cannot force that the freight rate cannot be increased. And during the COVID time, I think this has been a global phenomenon where the, the freight rates have uh, got increased. Though it is a concern for the government, and we try to uh, facilitate to the possible extent by organizing the meetings and raising the issue. Mm -hmm. And we ask that at least the let Ministry of Civil Aviation or Ministry of Shipping uh, issue an advisory to the shipping lines. So wherever it is possible, they, they should try to uh, minimize the, the freight rate. Credit is not the uh, subject. I am not a technical expert in this credit part of the area, so I will not touch upon that. Uh, with regard to uh, Kaushal, uh, he raised very uh, valid uh, two issues. One is uh, Vision's uh, uh, utilization. He mentioned about Japan, and uh, this year, uh, KB was able to export successfully a good quantum of export of mango uh, to Japan. But uh, in the last two years, if you see, when the Prime Minister, with the intervention of the Prime Minister, that a target, agri export target was set up. And last year, it was $400 million. And with this, the uh, first uh, meeting was taken up by at the level of Honorable Prime Minister. Then the Commerce Minister took up the meeting, two round of meetings with the, uh, all the Indian embassies. The, the, the all the potential countries and the missions were asked to activate themselves. So in every mission, there is a basically a commercial commerce department where basically commercial counselor and trade attache is there, just providing support for uh, this uh, uh, trade aspect, the import and export. But I, I fully agree what he is saying. If the missions are activated, missions are properly utilized. Though missions have their practical problems in terms of shortage of manpower also. But uh, since last two years, I have found that uh, uh, all the missions have got activated. At least they are trying. And uh, where are we are interacting with the missions, we are getting uh, good support. And I think in future, definitely we will push it further. Uh, how, how basically uh, missions can help in uh, promoting the exports from the country. The quarantine aspect, uh, industry interface uh, with regard to market access is a very valid. Because what happens in the, for the market access from Indian government side, whether either it is the PIDA or Ministry of Agriculture or Ministry of Animal Husbandry, whenever we interact with our counterpart, the, 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 the technicalities on the, with the practical aspect, we don't have the knowledge. Let me, let me accept that. Industry is the, basically, they are the people who can tell the ground reality. So while the market access process, at least we are able to uh, protect the concerns of our Indian industry. So, Kaushal, I appreciate uh, these two points which we have noted. I will definitely, whenever while interaction with NPPO or uh, Ministry of Agriculture, we will take it up that whenever the market access process is there, there is a, uh, the industry needs to be consulted and there is industry interface required. So, uh, from my side, uh, I would like to conclude this because uh, my, as I already informed that uh, there is an engagement and so I will not be able to continue, but I really enjoyed this uh, session. I, I, I wish that I could have continued for uh, to the end of the program. No, thank you, Dr. Sudanshu. I think it was very valuable to hear your inputs and sort of see all the things and initiatives that are being done uh, by FEDA. And uh, we look forward to having you on board on, on sort of future sessions that we'll have where we'll dive down deep into some of these topics that we discussed today. Definitely, definitely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rohit. Uh, and uh, thanks and uh, uh, my all the best wishes to all the participants and the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thanks, sir. Sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll uh, we'll carry on from I think the the, the last uh, discussion that we were having, and I, it it turns out obviously that quality is a big concern. Uh, Jinmay, I'll I'll come back to you. Uh, I know sort of I had to skip, but uh, what are what what is what do you see? Uh, you know, you are heading uh, food chain ID. What do you see as problems, and what do you see as solutions uh, for this problem of quality? Um, great. Uh, and happy to see that quality is ultimately coming out as one of the concerns because uh, every time in such kind of fair, it's all about trade, the price game and, 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 the, and the financial aspects. So quality probably gets the last priority. And thanks, Sashim, for asking this question because that's exactly the topic. So is it possible for me to share my screen? I want to show you one, um, sure. one analysis. So yeah, my screen sharing is disabled. If you can enable that. I think it's enabled now. Okay, great. 
So uh, what I'm sharing with you is, uh, oh, sorry, uh, this data. Are you able to see this horizon scan screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. So this is a software which collects all the uh, rejects, import rejects, export rejects, I mean, import rejects, border refusal, uh, rejects by customs, uh, you know, recall, withdrawal from 180 countries. What we have generally is the rejects from US and the Europe, but not from other countries. So barring, um, let's say, the Africa, it, uh, it captures everything. So now what I want to show you is if you see the result, okay, I mean, it's commodity, exporting country, company, reason for notifying what is the hazard and when it has been, uh, you know, so it has got landscape of entire thing. And if I just put India, I have just uh, made this as an India. And so you can see here 8093 rejects in last one year across all commodities, which is really a very big uh, number when it comes to uh, you know indian operations now you see the reason okay aflatoxin aerobic colony count misleading the, uh, you know the undeclared allergens uh, salmonella pesticide salmonella salmonella aflatoxin mislabeling veterinary drugs etc and to a level of even fraudulent documentation now these are something which is uh, i'll stop sharing my screen now and this data is like, uh, you know, I can, those who want it for a specific commodity, it's available for around 650 commodities. Now, if you see this, majority of these points are associated with operational activities, which even Dr. Sudhanshu was mentioning. So we have pesticide. So if I classify quality, uh, we, we need to classify it for two, two categories. One is commodity and the second one is processed food. When it comes to commodities, it's, it is essentially about pesticides and uh, and veterinary drugs and you know those kind of chemical hazards. Then we come to the processing side. It's all about microbiological contamination, no approved addition, you know additive addition, mislabeling, uh, fraudulent documentation, etc. So these two are the main reasons, or these are the main reasons because of which we are having uh, uh, you know export rejections. Now, how do we, so it's not, when we say quality, I would like to put, you know, not quality, but essentially food safety. I mean, I know quality includes food safety, but uh, these are because if we use something which is now for, I'll give you an example, citric acid, it is an approved chemical, it's an approved ingredient. Now, whether citric acid is approved for that particular country as a flavor enhancer or as a pH regulator, or as a preservative depends on that country's regulation. So many of the time, if the regulations of the exporting country are not known, that is where the trade barrier starts, which is one of the major reason for um, uh, in, in the trade barrier activities. The other reasons it includes like, you know, hygiene and sanitary conditions, which is like, we all know uh, how it is, you know, manufactured, how it is, uh, uh, we, we still have, we have come a lot when it comes to hygiene and sanitation, but we do have miles to go, uh, you know, when it, uh, you know, in this, in this particular space, then something like, uh, you know, packaging conditions or the quality of packaging, labeling requirements, then occupational health and safety, employment, uh, employment laws, then or certificate of origin, certi certificate of uh, authenticity. These are all some of the trade barriers which are, uh, you know, coming out on a very, you know, which are probably the reason of that 8903 rejections, what we have for in, from India. So um, what we need, you know, in terms of qualities, we need uh, agencies to have a compilation. Now, if it's a startup, they want to export well and good, but now how do we support them? Do how do, because they don't, they might not have competence of the regulation. Can there be a publicly available landscape made? These are the pesticides. These are the countries. This is allowed. This is not allowed. Uh, this is the, you know, one, you know, rejection for one time rejection accepted. This is not accepted. So if we can have that landscape available for public domain on the, you know, on the reasons for uh, that will be one area wherein maybe the agencies need to work upon. 
whether government or go private or in in partnership that that can be a separate topic and the second part would be like market entry report so something which is essential that okay for this particular country these are the these are the areas so market entry reports is one potential area which i feel is important so thank you i mean so from my point i think i would uh, this is the first uh, part i would say no thanks lot in way i think that was very useful i mean it's just i mean that the, the number is quite uh, stark actually you know and when you look at it uh, there are a lot of people who are very well established so i just want to make a sort of quick uh, point to this this rejection i lost you uh, rohit uh... Uh, Haldi Rams and etc. Bari Lal that you mentioned that they had uh, um, hygiene issues or quality issues or or is it both uh, non availability of information on the regulatory side plus an hygiene issue as well? Uh, no, what I am trying to do does not take the names. It can happen sure. with anything, right? It's sure. it's about it's about having uh, you know it's not just the processing part. It's also the supply chain part which comes in picture. Now, uh, if I'm uh, if the product requires temperature, you know, storage in a specific way, and it's not maintained during the supply chain, the product is going to get damaged. That's something that you know is primarily seen in the prime in the uh, you know fresh fruits and vegetables. activity so there are multiple reasons it's not about one company not performing or this thing something has gone wrong in the supply chain probably something has gone wrong might at the you know manufacturing at that particular point or maybe even you know sometimes it's also the test method so is the same aflatoxin testing so is it what is the test method that is being followed i remember we doing one uh, case study for the you know fresh fruits and vegetable importers for india so it is not a export it was for the importers uh, you know for india and we had done a mapping of you know codex method uh, you know what are the codex requirement what are fssi requirement and what are other requirements so what is the value and then what are the methods by which this testing is done and there has been huge difference so that's something that is also you know um, that also comes in picture you know when it comes to doing a complete uh, let's say that why there has been a rejection because their method our method could also be different great so you're saying there are multiple aspects of this uh, both from a testing perspective from a supply chain perspective from a non non availability of, of of enough information about the import regulations perspective and all of these need to be addressed holistically to ensure that the final okay. product is not rejected okay. so i think that's great and i think at this point of time i'd also like to uh, you know uh, sort of put this forth to uh, as a as a as a financier i mean abhishek I mean, when you look at food and agriculture exports, uh, and when you see these kinds of uh, issues with uh, rejections, either on the documentation side or or, or issues with quality, uh, what what do you see as uh, as as ways in which uh, you can sort of combat this and make sure that lending is available to to exporters? Um, and and how important, in your view, is this uh, is this access to export finance? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Roit, and uh, uh, I would like to also thank uh, you know uh, Think KG for having me here for the session today. So briefly, I mean, I'll just uh, uh, from uh, you know practitioner's perspective, you know, I was hearing to Dr. Sudhanshu also and other panelists also. So I'll, I'll quickly tell that uh, uh, how this export finance and access to export finance is important for bank. Okay, so uh, uh, as a bank, uh, we have a deployment of credit. Okay, and the deployment goes to uh, different sectors, different industries, and all that. Uh, exports is typical or particular in a way that uh, banks feel comfortable to get into this transaction uh, for a simple reason uh, that uh, there is evidence of uh, trade happening, underlying trade happening. Okay, so the different offerings bank can make to a customer to meet his uh, working capital requirement or financing requirement. It could be a term loan. it could be a simple overdraft or something but trade is very uh, peculiar and very specific and you know uh, sort of uh, like the banks or bankers because uh, this is totally based on underlying two parties are having some contract and there's goods getting shipped across boundaries so there is clear visibility that something is happening i can i can actually see the activity happening there which may not be uh, that visible if i do a simple overdraft sort of line or line of credit or general uh, line of credit so th that way it gives comfort to bank getting into these transactions okay so to that extent bank banks are comfortable there so uh, now access to export finance okay 
So uh, I think this question is more pertinent to uh, small players, emerging players, FTOs, MSME. Okay. So large entities and large players, they anyways they manage to get the bank credit uh, directly, indirectly through capital market or through different sources. So for them, it's it's not an, uh, an aspect you know or issue to discuss. But definitely, uh, it holds a lot of weight when talk about MSMEs or new entrants or maybe uh, upcoming players in the market. It definitely makes a lot of sense and to you know explore this opportunity. So uh, there, I think, uh, you, you knowing that it's all clear to uh, everybody in, in the panel and uh, that, you know, the banks are uh, sort of uh, most regulated uh, sort of organization, you know, we, we are guided and dictated by RBI, where we have also, we have also, you know, be guided by what Sushant was saying, whatever guideline APIDA is issuing, RBI is saying, there are multiple schemes bank have to follow. Keeping all that in mind, so uh, our ministry that's it's totally regulated, so we have to work in those, uh, you know, guidelines and all that. So uh, giving credit to everybody is may not be possible at all point of time. Okay, there could be some challenges. New players, just establishing players, uh, may not have good financial credentials and all that. So bank may or may not like to you know shake hands with them initially. Okay, but uh, at the same time there are ways and means wherein even the new players can come along and they can they can avail uh, some financing. There's ways. Probably you can ring, uh, ring fence the cash flows. You can have some payment guarantees. Uh, you can have some con uh, counterparty guarantees in place, so that uh, these enablers can facilitate the trade uh, part of uh, financing for those new entities. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll just quickly, uh, you know, give you some perspective how, how we have fared uh, in the last five years at a bank level. Uh, I mean, when I say bank level, it's, it's a banking industry as such. So I can say that uh, export in the last five years between 18 to 22, I'm saying the total export service plus merchandise export. It has gone uh, from say uh, 35 lakh crore in INR terms to say 51 lakh crore broadly, if, if you convert the dollar into you know average uh, rupee terms and all that broadly. So 50% growth uh, in export volume total uh, for India in the last five years. In comparison to the same, uh, the bank credit deployment has also increased by 55% across the banks, private, MNC, whatever bank you can think of. So the bank credit deployment has also increased from 77 lakh crore to 119 lakh crore in the same time horizon. So export grew by 50, 50%, bank credit deployment also grew by uh, say 55%. And within that, that trade finance uh, services and deployment of credit towards that has also grown to 40%. So I can basically see that uh, the access to credit has increased you know, uh, in, in line with uh, export growth of the country at overall level. Uh, within agri, uh, it may not be uh, exactly one on one, okay. But there also there is significant growth. So you have to say uh, in terms of number, how much uh, export, uh, you know, how much of uh, credit deployment has happened by bank in the last five years towards agri and uh, food processing. So I think uh, it was ten lakh, uh, approximately ten lakh crore in 2018, and now it stands at around fifteen lakh crore. In 2022, so broadly it has also increased by 40 percent. So we, we, we are uh, we are in range of 40 to 50 percent in terms of export growth, bank credit deployment, and deployment uh, of credit towards agri and food processing activity. So banks are open, uh, but bank would still like to mitigate the risk because anyways we are we have very fiduciary role. We are guided by regulators and all that. But I think that there's a, there's a proper pace getting maintained as we grow, uh, you know, uh, at export level, as we grow at economy level, and banks are very much willing to, you know. Uh, uh, step in and uh, follow that uh, pace, at least in the way we are going as of now. No, I think that's great. And, and I think uh, particularly, I think I understand that from a bank's perspective, this is a very challenging trade, food and agriculture specifically, especially when you talk about SMEs. Uh, it's a very challenging trade to, to finance, given that uh, there is a lack of information available about transactions that have been conducted. There's lack of information on the other side. Uh, of who the buyer is, there is uh, there is all these quality issues and documentation, which you know, which which increase the amount of risk that uh, that a bank has to take on a particular transaction and on a particular borrower who might be an exporter. So I think what what I wanted to kind of understand from you is that what is a bank doing to make sure that even more access is available, and what specifically are you doing? Are you working with fintechs and startups uh, to ensure that this data, this information gap that is present currently? On SME exporters in food and agriculture, that 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 is addressed. Are you is, is that something that is uh, uh, actively being pursued, or what is the bank's uh, view on this? Yeah, right. So uh, yeah, just to answer that, so uh, it it is uh, very much on radar now. Okay. So uh, you must be knowing that as uh, uh, Dr. Sudanshu was saying that there's a cluster approach of MSME cluster approach of having that food uh, industries and district wise, you know, identification product. 
So in the same way, uh, uh, we, we know that you know um, uh, in this MSME segment and all that, bank is also taking that uh, cluster approach. Okay, most of the banks, big banks, anyways, they have taken the new banks are also following the same path. Okay, the cluster approach. So uh, they, there, we are just trying to uh, sort of scan or map certain clusters which are hypothetical clusters from agri perspective. It could be Nashik for your some crops, or it could be some pomegranate, some other crops, and bananas, some other crops. So uh, uh, we are trying to map those clusters, identify those clusters first of all. And uh, we just have to have some sort of, also trying to have some sort of data about the past defaults of those, uh, of the borrowers in that region, okay? So I have, I have a territory, I have a crop, and I have a tentative, uh, you know, sort of uh, probability of default of customers in those, uh, you know, area. So we, we do sort of a data scrubbing, okay? So, so that we get actually profile of a uh, geography, that in this geography, uh, probably the possibility of default in worst case scenario will be this, okay? So some sort of, uh, you know, that data scrubbing and mapping is happening at bank level, though it is very crude, and we are definitely taking help of fintech to uh, come and help us. Okay, but this is actually at very nascent stage. Uh, we, we can say it's, it's basically at POC stage, a proof of concept stage, basically more like discussing and understanding their point of view. But the idea is that to identify such clusters, identify those crops, and also identify the risk profile of the borrowers in that segment, and then typically uh, go into those uh, clusters. So maybe um, th there could be 40 uh, or 80 or odd clusters, okay? But uh, maybe bank like us uh, may identify say five or 10 clusters wherein we file the profile of customers would be relatively safe, okay, to go ahead. So this is those uh, data scrubbing and help of FinTech and uh, whatever, uh, you know, input we can get, uh, uh, you know, historically. I, we are trying to have those uh, diagrams prepared and uh, probably uh, that would approach to target those clusters uh, as, as far as this uh, export financing, uh, you know, approach or any other uh, lending approaches to be, uh, you know, uh, thought of for those segments, those clusters in ag agri-processing uh, segment from bank's perspective. I think this is what we're trying to do as of now. Great, great. Uh, Hemindar, I mean, I'd like to sort of pose that question to you as well. And sort of, since you come from a sort of financial banking uh, background and looking at agri-finance, uh, what what do you see as, uh, as as mitigation steps to ensure that more SMEs get uh, more SMEs get financed, more smaller exporters get financed? And is it that you need to take uh, you know collateral from the SMEs or get more information about the SMEs, or is it that you need to get more information about the transaction itself and 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 do contract financing and trade financing? Um, I think both are required in some cases, and of course uh, uh, Abhishek is probably better place to answer this question. Um, but uh, clearly, uh, I think uh, it, it's very important uh, in terms of the credit worthiness of the SME itself, you know, whether the transaction is export oriented or for the domestic market, like secondary, I think the credit worthiness of the SME is extremely important. Uh, and that's where if you see most of the SMEs in food uh, processing, agro processing, uh, that has been one of the challenges. The, 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 the rating which SMEs have typically BBB or you know BBB minus and all that and that's why the interest rates are extremely high so that is clearly dependent on their financial health uh, that needs to improve in general and not not just for the purpose of exports uh, second I think in terms of uh, building transparency on the transaction side I think that's also extremely critical and I'm uh, glad to report that what I've seen in the last few years especially on the SME front is a lot of digitization happening, a lot of new ERPs getting implemented, a lot of quality consciousness. Of course, it's a big issue and Chinmoy pointed it out already. Uh, but uh, I think we still continue to differentiate between domestic and export supply chain. I think that's, I think at some point of time that has to go. If we really have to come out of this uh, quality challenges, you know, and, and because we believe that this quality is acceptable to a domestic customer, uh, but it's not acceptable to a customer sitting in Japan or Netherlands. That that's where the challenge begins. Uh, of course, it also means cost, and there's up to the perception that whether Indian consumer can afford it or not. But I think that in general, the quality consciousness among consumers is also going up. So whether it's an SME or a distributor or an aggregator in the supply chain, the the understanding of quality has to go multiple times. I, I completely agree on that. Uh, I think that is not the priority area, and that's why. Our ability to export is, is very, very limited. And I think the last point I want to mention as the supply chain is becoming more integrated, you know, more traceable, right? From farmer to an FPO or an aggregator to a processor to distributor to a let's say an importer. I think with that digitization, the ability for banks or financial institutions 
school land is going to go significantly higher because you know essentially banks want to see that loop closing you know if there are broken uh, sort of pieces in the in the chain banks will always be nervous who's buying who's selling who's going to pay when they're going to pay right so i think that part that and that in general is going to open up a lot of opportunities uh, with more digitization all the way to farm uh, we we are seeing that and with people like you coming in who are trying to build a platform and people like you who can really take care of the of of the trade facilitation part which is extremely critical but the back end part of the supply chain is also um, digitizing uh, in a, in a in a significant way now we are seeing a lot of agri tech fintech merging or some intersections of agri tech and fintech happening already so i think this is where uh, this is the overall contours of the thing that they stand i'm hopeful uh, as we go along a lot of these challenges that we see today may be taken care of and uh, there'll be smes uh, there are of course we have kb on the call and there are quite a few exporters who can be qualified as a sme uh, or or really really trying to build an export uh, sort of strategy export market of course and these players all always and domestic market as a priority but i am so happy to see even among fresh fruits and vegetable category people sitting out of mandis out of azadpur washi who never thought of export import as the core are clearly looking at as a big big opportunity no i think that's wonderful and i think the key message there i think it was very, very interesting this digitization of the entire supply chain and ensuring that the enough information is available for banks and financial institutions to be able to take a risk and understand the risk and underwrite that risk i think is fundamental to making sure that we have more uh, export financing available quickly i wanted to sort of go to uh, snail because i think she pointed this out uh, before and i wanted to kind of understand what what is it that you're seeing because you are importing from uh, Uh, from smaller exporters what is it that you're seeing is is the main pain point when they have an interaction with uh, with the financial institution and uh, and and how does it how does it uh, sort of uh, prevent them from uh, exporting more snail you there okay i think she might be um, away so kaushal maybe i'll 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 put that question to you as well i mean do you see that as a I'm as a significant sorry, sorry, oh, sorry, sorry. sorry i'm here go ahead go ahead yeah uh, can you repeat the question please no so the question was that essentially i mean what are the pain points that you see on a credit side from an exporter because you are interacting with a lot of smaller exporters as well out of india and what what are the pain points uh, that they uh, pose to you when they are interacting with banks uh, so uh uh unorganized farm sector is first issue there is unorganized uh, farm sector all, all over the india then uh, lack of post harvesting uh, harvesting technology i said you firstly then at every point of finance problem at each and every step exporters need a finance that is a big issue this is for yes bank specifically uh then uh, finding the right buyer finding the right buy is the uh, another uh, exporter ka matlab exporter ke liye bahut zyada zaruri hai ki uh, acha buyer milna chahiye nahi to fir to fir sara waste hai uske liye then uh, sudden government decision this uh, government is making sudden decisions like ban or some uh, somehow any any uh, decision these are the uh, main things okay all right and our payment terms i mean kaushal and maybe you can answer this as well is our our essentially payment terms or ability to sort of give credit to a buyer often a, a hampering point for uh, for exports yes yes uh, credit uh, uh, nobody is giving credit as such to the exporter they are offering uh, 10 15 days uh, 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 payment terms okay yeah kaushal you see that as well uh, on your side uh, payment terms being an issue uh not uh, in all cases i think we might be a bit biased that we are quite established and we have a good presence so we generally do not have to struggle too much on that front where you know we have to earn the trust of the buyer before he sends out some advance uh, there are however a lot of uh, international tools available where you can safeguard yourselves so international credit insurance is very much available uh, for that matter even ecgc is available but there are a lot of ifs and buts around ecgc which is the export credit guarantee corporation uh 
the documents have to be transacted only through a bank which is very difficult for an air freight business unless they are an export house so for a small business it is quite complicated to avail ecgc benefits but uh, yeah if the government can facilitate some of these uh, gray areas it will become much easier for the exporters to then avail of not only export financing but also uh, some uh, secured payment all right all right so i think i mean probably uh, sort of uh, more established players have less of an issue with securing financing and being able to do uh, uh, transactions uh, using the lines that are available to them but maybe it's a bigger issue for the smaller exporters who are just starting up uh, where they don't have necessarily the credit history available yeah i think packing credit as well till till 10 years ago we were actually not even aware of what packing credit is all about and as we started growing we started actually recognizing some of these uh, tools which are available so we start using packing credit in foreign currency which allows us to have a natural hedge as well as an arbitrage uh, arbitrage is of course not no bank will like to hear that but when it comes to the natural hedge at least uh, we are exporting and we need to repay the packing credit in foreign currency as well so the export and import is in the same currency uh, sorry the export is in the same currency but the borrowing repayment is also in the same currency so it allows you to avoid taking a forward cover uh so those forward the hedging costs are uh, saved that's why it's called a natural hedge uh so a lot of these uh, interesting tools are available and if you are engaging very well with your banking partner then they are very likely to uh showcase a lot of these facilities that the government does offer there is a very serious interest subvention available for exporters up to 5% uh you can have an effective cost of borrowing as low as 2 and a half 3% including processing cost so again you need to know where to look for it you need to get the right banker to support you and you will never get the best deal in uh, year 1 but as you progress with the bank you will generally get better deals so i think uh, exporters have to be more watchful of uh, a lot of opportunities or a lot of facilities that the government and the banking industry has for them and they need just just need to look out in the right place sure and i think that's that's great i think the availability of packing credit and at a very competitive rate is, is is actually quite encouraging but that's all only for the pre shipment part right i mean do you from what i our conversations as uh, as a firm when we talk to people about post shipment financing uh, and international factoring invoice discounting on a post shipment basis that is still uh, very much unavailable to food and agriculture exporters uh, because international factors are often reluctant uh to participate in uh, in post shipment financing of these kind of products is this, is this something that you see as well unfortunately i don't have too much experience with that tool but i do know there are uh, products available in the market uh, we are not availed those uh, but i do know that there are similar uh, options available uh, i think uh, what i remember of hand is mers which is a shipping company also had its finance division where they offer yeah. this with their post export financing so if the buyer is uh, vouched by them then they immediately discount the invoice and offer you the money up front so i think internationally options are available whether they are available in the indian banking system that i'm not sure sure yeah i mean just for information most straight finance uh, shut down uh, uh, primarily uh, yeah primarily because they couldn't uh, sustain the amount of uh, non performing assets that they had um but yeah i think this food and agriculture tends to be a, a domain which is uh, which is also where uh, again lo- lo- lack of information trying to get the entire data from from the buyer all the way to the seller available to the bank and and being able to give that comfort to the bank that uh, this transaction is not going to go bad is is, is an important aspect and i think that's where digitization like even there was mentioning startups like us which are uh, which are actively playing a role in in trying to get uh, this this problem sorted out i think is 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 going to be important i think also what what uh, what plays a, a big um, sort of component in international trade uh, is 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 the supply chain itself you know i mean there are uh, all the way from post harvesting to to getting the stuff to the uh, to the retail store of a buyer um i think there's a there's a pretty long supply chain uh, that that is involved in between and oftentimes that itself is a you know is a weakest point in the link so just want to kind of understand uh, i mean kaushal i mean you've been in this uh, for quite some time just want to understand what what is it that you see as areas of uh, of problems and and kind of what are the ways in which you you have found solutions for uh specifically in the context of finance so no, specifically in the context of supply chain uh, integrity you know how do you make sure the quality that you have uh, post harvest uh, does not deteriorate by the time it gets to a customer and the entire supply chain between how do you manage that 
Sure. So as a business, we are very integrated uh, and has been necessitated by the kind of businesses we want to pursue. Uh, you know, produce is a commodity business and how can we not make it a commodity business by bringing in some points of differentiation? Uh, initially, we were able to differentiate based on just our food safety initiatives. So we were actually undertaking a lot of uh, crop protection or plant protection sprays ourselves, even on small farmer fields. Quite risky because what if the farmer doesn't honor his contract? But then we had to take that plunge so that we could offer the assurance to the end customer that we are extremely secure on par with our own farm in terms of food safety, even though we are engaging with small farmers. So we did uh, revisit the model. We started doing a lot of farming ourselves in between. Again, we switched back to the small farmer, but with the chemical spray in our control. And as we went along, we started actually making those chemical sprays ourselves uh, into organic sprays. And we found that they were actually more effective and more uh, capable. So we have KB Bio Organics, which is our uh, organic pesticide venture, which is serving more than a million farmers at the moment. Uh, in various states of India. So it's growing even bigger than what we need in terms of our sourcing needs. Uh, we have, as Dr. Sudhanshu had mentioned, five pack houses, all uh, government subsidized and uh, supported. We have 60 vehicles, again, all government subsidized and promoted. Uh, the vehicles cost, uh, the payback is less than two years. So it's a no brainer. We have to go for our own investment on those vehicles. Uh, we also have uh, a freight forwarding division. So about 8,000 tons of produce that we ship, we do with an in-house freight forwarding. You would easily save a fair bit of money every year just on the commissions that we otherwise would have had to pay a forwarder. And then uh, to complete the chain, we also now have a, a branch office in UK, which uh, handles all our sales operations in the UK market, which is our major market. So this end-to-end -end integration is uh, creating a lot of value for us as a business. And it is also giving a lot of assurance to our customers that there's a company in India who is very serious about food safety and also very serious about uh, supply chain efficiencies. So there's a lot of uh, rehandling and repacking that Indian product goes through in our destination market. So we try and do it everything in-house. So we have complex machines which pack, uh, pre-packs, uh, date-coded, barcoded, labeled, uh, shelf-ready boxes, so all, all that is to be done on arrival is just uh, put the product onto the shelf of the supermarket. The importer does not do any other activity other than just clear the product through customs. And I think this has given a lot of direct access to a lot of retailers because they recognize that there is no need for a UK uh, business uh, for sourcing out of India. You can just ask the Indian company to pack at source, label at source and uh, dispatch in a shelf ready box. I think these things uh, are what, I mean, necessity is the mother of invention. And we kept realizing that to differentiate ourselves, we need to innovate. And I think these innovations were necessitated at that time, but now we feel that they are uh, absolutely essential to our uh, business model. No, I think, that, thanks a lot. I think you're right. Uh, the innovation is key to, to, to this whole thing and, and, and making uh, us meet the targets that we want to meet. Uh, Hevinder, I mean, and, uh, uh, Chinmay as well. I mean, what what are you seeing in terms of technology innovations that are being deployed, uh, whether it's on the quality side, Chinmay, or whether it's uh, broadly, uh, Himinder, uh, which you think are essential to get um, uh, food exports uh, to grow at the pace that they need to grow? So I can I... talk from the startup perspective. Chinmay, want to go? You can go ahead. Please go ahead. Okay, so I think there are two or three uh, uh, innovations that I really like and can potentially facilitate uh, more exports. Uh, one is uh, around quality assaying. So we are see seeing a lot of application of image processing and this image process images are captured either through mobile phones or sometimes through computer vision or uh, sometimes through spectrometers. And uh, you get instant result, almost instant result, let's say 30 minutes or even sometime less than an hour on some physical properties and also the biochemical properties of, of the commodities, right? So I think that to me is, uh, is kind of very, very relevant for all kinds of supply chain, but especially exporting supply chain where you can get very accurate assessment and you need to go to laboratories is kind of reduced. I won't say it's completely out. I think that's one. 
Secondly, the tra traceability solution, which is essentially built around uh, distributed ledgers, right? So, you know, as soon as irrespective of where the product is in the supply chain, you have a complete history, the farmer, the farm, the location, depending on what importers are looking for, right? It's not that you have to capture more than what is required. But if importers want to know which farm it is coming from, which area, who was a farmer, and and how it was stored, how it was transported, what was the temperature or humidity at the in, in the transportation, etc. If, if if those are the requirements, so and and the quality test and at multiple point of time, we have the quality reports. So I find traceability solution and the multiple players there, Tracex and Boldog Web Services, Source Trace, and many others have done a phenomenal job. Uh, so I think these solution to me uh, can, of course, uh, facilitate a lot of export transactions. What I want to see is more uh, international trade facilitation platform, what you are building, what uh, some of the other players are building, you know, uh, uh, that, uh, that is going to be the key. Because especially when you look at bringing exporters, importers together, I think that's where the challenge is, you know. And there's a long tail, you know, the, the small, you talked about the SMEs, the SMEs who want to export, but don't know who's the exporter, uh, who's the importer, the credibility, whether it's going to pay or not. Likewise for importer, they don't know the, 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 the credibility of the exporter, especially the, the smaller ones. So I think that is going to be the key, you know, how do you build that trust using your platform? And that's where players like you, and I, I know at least three or four others who have done a fantastic job. In, in building that uh, platform, though very, very early stage, to be honest, but I'm sure it will pick up. Uh, and how do you bring multiple players on the same platform, like shippers and financiers and certification agency, et cetera? I think that is another role you can play. So I think these are two or three kind of startups I see. Uh, I, uh, I also believe a lot of domestic startups who focus on buy local, sell local, will ultimately look at building export supply chains. So that's a matter of time when we see some of the well-funded supply chain startups in India building an export strategy. That could be another sort of addition to this group. But but yeah, I'm, I'm, I am I'm definitely see startups playing a very, very important role going forward uh, in, in sort of pushing exports, food exports out of India. Chinmay, I mean, I mean, uh, so if I yeah. mentioned uh, you know, new technologies uh, that are being used, whether it's uh, spectrometer or image processing and all that, is that something that you see are also uh, sort of important aspects for you as food chain ID is, or, or is that still something that you're exploring? Sure. So I'll give my answer from two perspectives. One is from the farmer perspective and in the pre-farm gate and the post-farm gate. So the new technologies which are at the pre-farm gate, what we have seen is because we also do sustainability certification. So we have seen uh, companies which are like Uber and Ola for the, you know, for the farmers. So for example, they aggregate. So if someone has purchased 50 kg of, let's say, fertilizer and there is another farmer who needs only 5 kg, this guy has used 45 kg. Yes, five, he'll put that I have five kgs in this. And so this guy will, you know, buy five kg. He doesn't have to spend money for 50 kg, which otherwise would have been waste for him. So that's kind of getting aggregated for the, you know, you know aggregation of the agriculture inputs, which is saving, uh, you know, cost to the farmer. So that's one technological uh, part, which we, not technological really, but essentially a good way of aggregator, uh, you know, which is helping the farmers. And at the post cover farm gate, what uh, Himandri has said, like uh, the blockchain technology has emerged in a multiple way. And uh, it's just not helping for traceability, but it is also helping for trade transactions, uh, 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 for, you know, giving a, you know, transparency to the organization. So I still remember in one of the organizations. So you, if you remember, there has been a horse meat issue, which, which had really rocked down the food world a uh, few years back. And uh, so companies now what they are doing is they are like having even DNA printing, uh, you know, at a as a part of their um, incoming inspection. So technology is being used for incoming inspection, wherein you just insert, put the, put the piece and then it Will, it will scan the DNA and tell whether the meat belongs to horse or meat belongs to buffalo and so on. So everyone has developed their own way. Digit, there is digitalization is non-negotiable. So whether it is um, 
एग्रीकल्चर फूड प्रोसेसिंग और इवन फॉर दैट मैटर न्यूट्रिशन सो यू नो टेक एनी थिंग द डेटा द बिग डेटा इज बींग जनरेटेड द रियल इश्यू लाइज इन हाउ दैट बिग डेटा इज बींग यूटिलाइज फॉर सम डिसीजन टेकिंग सो फॉर एग्जाम्पल वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट लेबोरेटरी टेस्टिंग सो ऑल टेस्ट रिपोर्ट आर अवेलेबल दे आर डिजिटलाइज बट हु इज देयर टू कोलेक्ट ऑल दैट डेटा विच इज अवेलेबल ऑन द कमोडिटी एंड इवेल्युएट ओके इंडिया में ये पेस्टिसाइड का प्रॉब्लम है ऑल दीज प्राइव लेबोरेटरी देर आर हंड्रेड ऑफ लेबोरेटरी जिनके पास का टेस्ट रिजल्ट है एंड दैट इज बींग इवेल्युएटेड ये प्रॉब्लम है यहाँ पे हमें यहाँ पे फोकस करना है सो दैट बिग utilization of big data is i would say a mode of action than just use of technology technology for uh, you know collecting or connecting the ecosystem exists but big data remains uh, still unutilized that's my perspective no thanks for that uh, chimay i think that's very useful to understand because you're a practitioner at the end of the day and i think uh, i mean if i were to sum this up because i think we are running out of time we also want to take some questions from audience questions if i were to sum it up um uh, what what we are seeing is a is a huge push from the government side to increase indian agricultural exports and uh, to reach the 100 billion dollar mark which uh, you know in the next 5 years let's say going doubling the exports that we have today we really need to work on multiple sides uh, we clearly need to work on uh, ensuring that uh, we are able to do supply demand matching get the right kind of market access to uh, to exporters we need to make sure that at a at a supplier level we are able to uh get the farm producer organizations working are able to collectively organize the small uh, land holding farmers and and consolidate their products so that they can be exported and then on the supply side we need to make sure that 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 the right kind of quality exists uh, not just for exports but as i mean amin there is pointing out also domestically we should have the same quality or the same aspirations for quality as as we have for uh, for exports so ensuring that we have uh at the farm gate and at every intervening step uh, till it gets to the buyer uh we want to make sure uh, we need to make sure that the, the quality assaying and the ability to test for various aspects of quality and food safety like uh, like chinmay was saying are are present and we're able to uh, look at this information um uh, in in almost uh, quasi real time using technologies like blockchain so there's there there is there there's there supply chain consolidation there is this quality uh there is uh, aggregation of all of this infrastructure whether it's uh, farm house uh, pack houses or warehouses uh where where the product can be stored safely at the right temperature or whether it's connecting those uh, those packing houses to the ports and then eventually to the export destinations this entire logistics uh needs uh, you know needs more uh, i think tightening up because they're currently fragmented uh it's it's very difficult for a person who's uh, who's sitting in uh, in lasalgaon to export uh, directly to a buyer in uh, uh, in rotterdam uh, because of the various amounts of uh, logistics challenges that they might have to face and the cost and the complexity of all of this is is quite significant as well and i think uh, underlying all of this are two things you know one of them is 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 the government push and the government uh, ability to coordinate all different stakeholder players but the also the other aspect of this is 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 bringing technology in to to c- connect the entire ecosystem to ensure that uh, the the exporters not only have the right kind of products at the right time at the right quality but also have the ability to finance this trade because export trade as all of you know is is very long lead time trades and it's it's important that uh, that banks are able to come in plug in get the right kind of information and 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 finance these kind of transactions so i think that is in for me the summary of uh, of the entire conversation that we had for the, for the past uh, one and a half hours what we would like to do and uh, abhijit I'll, i'll let you kind of uh, also let us know what are the audience questions that we can to sort of answer at this point of time uh, maybe i can put it up uh, there are uh... some general question there are some very specific questions and maybe i just first list the questions and then the panelists can respond so there's a question on the free trade agreements that we have signed it with uae in australia and we're going to sign it with uk canada eu and bangladesh how it is going to impact the the international food trade that's what, that's one question on on the fpas or uh, then there's sure. some specific questions on the export opportunities in the dairy products uh there's also a question on can can you tell us about export opportunities in bamboo leaf green teas i don't know do we have any expert 
for this category, but there are some category specific question. I think there are few things, few questions which has all which have already been discussed in terms of the challenges around pesticide residues and the exports and how do we limit it. Uh, but yeah, if someone wants to make any comment, uh, that would be good. Role of FPOs and how FPOs can be linked to export supply chain. I think that is also being discussed. Uh, how do I get pre-shipment finance? I think which Abhishek uh, addressed in, in already. Uh, yeah, so I think those are the questions. Uh, sure, sure. I think uh, some, uh, the, the first question, question. Was about free... Yeah, the last point I wanted to mention, Rohit, was this, uh, there's a question on schemes by government of India for encouraging exports. So, uh, so that, that's about it. Okay. So, Kaushal, maybe, maybe you have a perspective on this. I mean, uh, I can speak from a UAE perspective. We see a lot of trade between, uh, between India and UAE in terms of uh, uh, food and agriculture products and with the new uh, SEPA agreement that has been signed, uh, we see a lot of interest in the market to to buy more and more from Indian exporters. So I think these free trade agreements are definitely helping uh, in the context of the India-UAE uh, trade that is happening. But you probably you also have a, a view on the uh, on the trade that is uh, happening between India and Australia and, and elsewhere where free trade agreements are being signed. Actually, India has been very actively looked at as a food security uh, de-risking for a lot of these countries. They believe that India has the right uh, potential for them to you know, have long-term uh, food security addressed. I think some of these countries are also looking at international uh, you know, farm acquisitions. I think some of the African countries are offering long-term leases. But on, in the same context, I've been quite party to quite a lot of uh, meetings with the UA government where they are willing to invest in Indian uh, infrastructure. Uh, so that their food security need, uh, needs can be met. So I think these uh, FTAs are all going in that direction to facilitate such kind of investments where they have more control rather than just a trading relationship with uh, Indian companies. Uh, I can comment a bit on UK as well. UK seems to be also at a very active stage for a free trade agreement. And I think that will be a big boost for us because uh, a lot of uh, produce and a lot of uh, commodities are taxed at pretty high rates. Uh, and uh, once this uh, free trade agreements are in place, I think they will become much easier. I think Brexit has been a big boon for India. Uh, while the exchange at collapse earlier was, was, a, was a disaster, but apart from that, everything else has been positive. So the quarantine restrictions that EU has, uh, UK has removed those. So we are, are able to trade more, far more freely. Uh, we can ship guava, curry leaves, a lot of such produce to UK, which otherwise was not possible to ship to you, EU because the UK was following all the EU laws. So I, I think FTAs have to be scrutinized for what they bring to the table, but everything seems to be positive as of now. Great, great. Um, hey, are there any other specific questions you think uh, the panel can, uh, can pick on? Uh, I don't know if there's an expert on dairy or the, the tea exports, but uh, if not, then we can, we can skip it. Sure. I mean, I think one of the one of the takeaways I think from uh, uh, Pradeep's uh, presentation initially was also that uh, I think the focus uh, needs to be on developing the infrastructure on sp for specific commodities as well, where India has huge potential for exports. And I think uh, maybe in subsequent conversations that we have as a part of this uh, webinar series on exports, we can focus on those uh, kind of uh, product categories uh, which are of interest and which have uh, potential for high volume. And maybe some of these things will be covered under uh, under those yeah. those kind of conversations. A scheme so, for uh, government schemes, I think I would recommend. I think Pradeep presented a very good slide on the various government schemes uh, for exports in general and for development of the supply chain uh, from Ministry of Food, Ministry of Agriculture, APDA, etc., and also uh, other institutions like MPDA, etc. So I think one can look at the website and get more details uh, about the schemes. Okay, sure. I think I mean, that's that's about. I think it. we can. Yeah. I mean, we, you can have the. Uh, I think just maybe say a few words about uh, you know closing this whole conversation. I think it was fantastic conversation. It was wonderful to see all this participation from all of these different industry players as well as the government. Uh, and I think uh, what what this leaves us with is is that uh, uh, we need to still be working uh, on all of these fronts very very hard to uh, to make sure that India can be a export powerhouse and uh, 
it looks like uh, everything is going the right direction. And uh, but we just need to make sure that we are all doing a bit, uh, whether it's on the supply chain side or the financing side or the supply side or the quality side, uh, to make sure that we reach that goal. So that's uh, I'll, I'll leave it to you to close the session and say a few words. Sure, sure. No, thanks, Rohit, for wonderful moderation. Uh, thanks very much. It was very, very insightful. And uh, really want to thank uh, all the panelists, you know, uh, who came for this. Uh, Dr. Sudan Shu, I think, is not there. But uh, uh, thanks to him for, for sparing his time. Abhishek, Kaushal, Pradeep uh, for wonderful presentation, Chinmoy, Snehal. Uh, and everyone else, I think it's been a great, great uh, discussion. Uh, thanks very much uh, for joining us. And uh, we really look forward to do more of these, you know, because uh, there's, there's so much. Uh, I think we can't discuss all everything in within two hours. And, uh, you know, uh, but uh, we will make it like a series. It seems like there's a lot of interest uh, in, this, uh, in this topic. Uh, and we'll come back to you with uh, more announcements. Uh, and... Uh, hopefully make the discussions. We can even do category specific discussion if that merits, or we can talk about FTAs, we can talk about quality in specific if you wish, uh, so because there are very, very important aspects, uh, trade facilitation, pre-shipment finance. I think it, each, each one of these can be a topic by itself. So, so we'll, uh, we'll let you know how to proceed further on this series, but thanks all the panelists for sparing time, some really, really wonderful insights. And I also want to thank Abhiji to work very hard Absolutely. to get the get the agenda to get the to get all of you together. It, it wasn't easy for the first time we were doing it and we didn't know who were the right players. Uh, but all of you contributed and gave us some very wonderful ideas and 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 you had access to a network. So thanks to you and thanks to Abhiji for putting it together. And thanks to all the participants who came on this call. I'm sure. It would have benefited a lot and we look forward to your feedback and uh, we hope you continue to join think i governors as we go along so wish you a very good evening and uh, look forward to see you again thank you very much thank you Thanks, so everyone. much and thank you think AG, for uh, inviting thank you so much thank you <laughs> thanks. thanks simon sir thanks rohit thanks thank uh, you all the panelists and uh, participants thanks thanks for this